So I just wanted to thank you all for joining us here tonight for our GAR Hall special event Zoom presentation. If you can believe it, it's been a little bit over a year since we've been on this platform because we have gone back in person, um, but it's nice to be back here and um, be able to see everybody really, excuse me, really up close. So I just want to tell you really quick, a little bit about what we have coming up for the Historical Society. This coming Saturday, we have an Earth Day event, which is going to be at the GAR Hall. We'll have representatives from different organizations within Situate who will be talking about what they are doing to help our environment. We've got our fishermen, our garden clothes. We'll have a baby petting zoo, baby, not baby petting zoo, a baby animal petting zoo, excuse me. Um, it's gonna be a great day. Um, then we've got Sally Snowman, the lightkeeper from Boston Light, who is retiring this year. She'll be joining us at the GAR Hall. We'll have um, a speaker on um, her, her newest book, and I'm sorry, I can't pronounce her last name, so I'm not even going to try to damage it. She wrote the story, The Pirate's Wife, which is about um, Captain Kidd's wife. So she'll be joining us in person at the GAR Hall. And this summer, we're going to have the Rusty Skippers Band, which is a band of about 45 um, local musicians who are going to be playing at the Man House in July. And I've got all kinds of other exciting things coming up. So look out for those. Check our Facebook page and our website. And um, that will all keep you up to date. So now I want to welcome the New York Times bestselling author and journalist who has published 20 books, I believe, to date. He had a new one that just came out about a month or so ago, yeah. um, which I hopefully he will touch on that at the end of this discussion tonight. Um, he's been hailed as the country's best true crime writer. Um, we have Ron Francel, who is coming to us from New Mexico um, in the desert, right by his wonderful um, vineyard. Okay. So I found that quite interesting that he would have a vineyard in New Mexico. But anyway, we had a lovely conversation about that. Anyway, Ron is here. He's going to talk to us about Shadow Man, an elusive psycho killer and the birth of criminal profiling. Ron, welcome. Thank you for having me, Jean. And, and we are really privileged tonight. And I want to mention this right at the beginning because joining us is Patty Neiman, who is an accomplished actress, but was also the narrator of the audio book for Shadow Man last year when it came out. Fabulous. And, and she faced some extraordinary challenges and met them just beautifully. Uh, as uh, I may refer to her as we uh, answer some questions, but maybe your uh, audience has some questions about the audio book too. That's great. Um, so what we're going to do, the format will be, I will be asking Ron some questions. He will, you know, discuss them. Um, it'll evolve from there. If you have questions you'd like to ask Ron, you can put them in the chat if you know where your chat feature is. And at the end of this talk, Ron will answer those questions for you. So, um, like I said, we're going to leave the door open. People can come in as they do. It's a beautiful day here in Situate where we're up in the 80s, which is kind of not usual for us this time of year. So we might have some of our friends on the beach having a picnic, and hopefully they're watching this as well. So, Ron, tell us a little bit about yourself and why true crime. Why true crime? Uh, well, first, thanks for having me. This is this is a privilege. Uh, I'm really kind of the boringest person in the world. I think uh, I grew up in Wyoming. I went off to college and uh, became a journalist. Uh, I worked in newspapers. Uh, throughout the West until I landed at the Denver Post where I was a senior writer. 
Uh, my job was, to my way of thinking, the best beat in the United States. Uh, I covered the evolution of the American West. They gave me a Jeep and told me to go out there and find stories where the past, the present, and the future of the American West intersected. So I'm telling stories of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going, but with a twist. They wanted me to tell them in a special kind of way. I had written three novels before, I, before that job. And so they wanted me to do something a little different. They wanted me to tell stories in a kind of narrative voice, so tell it as a story, if you will, uh, rather than you know a typical news story, which just puts in the facts in descending order. Uh, they wanted a story. And so they sent me out into the world to find those kinds of stories and to tell them in that way. Uh, then came 9-11 <laughs> and four days after 9-11 I'm on an airplane with a photographer to the Middle East where we covered the beginning of the the war on terror from the Middle East from the streets and from uh, some units with American troops and it was coming back uh, tired and and a little disillusioned that some things happened that caused me to want to write a book about a crime against two young girls that lived next door to me when I was growing up in a small town in Wyoming. It forever changed me. It forever changed the people around me. Uh, and it changed that town. In a way, it was a mini 9-11. And suddenly I wanted to explore that kind of coming of um, cynicism, of, of a loss of innocence. When I did that, it became a, a book called The Darkest Night, and it became a huge bestseller. And suddenly I really couldn't do anything else, even if I'd wanted to go do a novel. None of the people on my team, the agents and editors, would let me. So when you ask why true crime, it's because um, a, because there's very little chance of me being able to do something else for a long time in there. Uh, but it also suits that narrative style that I was talking about, that storytelling style. And the stories that I'm telling are completely true stories. So they're journalism as well. Uh, so it, it fit just perfectly. Uh, and I'm happy about it. And when I think about what I'm going to do next, I naturally gravitate toward true stories and naturally gravitate towards stories with the kind of stakes that we see in crime stories, in especially murder stories. Okay, so Ron, can you take us back to Montana, 1973? Tell us about the crime. Tell us about Susie Yeager and what drew you to her story. In June of 1973, there's a family from Michigan, the Yeagers. Uh, it's mom, dad, five kids, and grandma and grandpa. And they meet in a small state park in western Montana uh, called the Headwaters State Park. Uh, for this big family vacation, really, uh, they, the, the Jaegers have been crossing the country from Michigan, uh, and they're spending a few days there at the headwaters, uh, and they're having a, a marvelous time. And the, the, the park is fairly uh, packed. There are a lot of people there, a lot of campers. Uh, it's a beautiful little place where uh, the, the, the waters uh, of the Missouri begin, really. Uh, so one night in late June, uh, mom and dad uh, go to bed in their their van and, and grandma and grandpa go to bed in their van. Four of the children uh, get into a tent that's pitched out on the grounds. Uh, and again, remember, there are a lot of other campers around. 
sometime around dawn, one of the kids wakes up and feels a breeze and, and just doesn't think that's right. How, you're in a tent, why would I feel a breeze? She figures something's wrong. She looks around, she sees a big rent um, hole in, in the back of the tent and figures that the wind has ripped it or, or something. But she also realizes that her little seven-year-old sister Susie isn't there. So she gets up, quickly runs around and tries to find Susie and can't find her, alerts her parents, uh, and very quickly, uh, everybody realizes Susie's nowhere to be found. She has disappeared sometime in the middle of the night, literally into thin air. Nobody knows where she is, and she's not around. Instead, there's this large half moon shaped hole cut in the tent where she was dragged out. Her little sleeping bag is just outside that hole, her uh, stuffed animals, but there's no Susie. And so somebody calls the sheriff, uh, the, a deputy arrives, a deputy named Don Houghton arrives. He quickly takes a look around. There's no obvious evidence except uh, the faded, a uh, trail through the dew in the grass where someone has walked off toward a parking lot uh, beside the park. The law in the United States, when a child is uh, abducted, and especially if there's going to be a ransom, and there's a belief that, that this was more than uh, a, a family abduction, uh, requires that the FBI get involved. And your historians will know that that dates back to the Charles Lindbergh kidnapping in the 30s. So within two hours, uh, the FBI is on the scene and the main FBI agent involved is a guy named Pete Dunbar, who happened to have actually grown up in that area uh, and was back in... Gallatin County, Montana, because his parents were ill. He'd worked in some hotbeds of crime with the FBI, but he was now back taking care of his parents when Susie Yeager goes missing. So that's that's the morning of the disappearance, and that's where this whole story begins. Okay, so when this happened, um, I believe J. Edgar Hoover was still the head of the FBI. Well, he had just died. Well, he had just he had, died. Yeah, he had just died. Right. So previous to that, there were a few agents within the FBI who had kind of been, if I understand correctly, dabbling in this profiling. Yes. Um, uh, Howard Teton and Pat Mullaney. Correct. But Hoover cousin wasn't really grabbing onto this theory. Yeah, and Hoover... Hoover thought this was black magic. He thought this was voodoo. He didn't, he didn't like the idea that evidence could be boiled down to what somebody might, what you think somebody might have been thinking. Uh, but to be fair to Hoover, he wasn't alone. In fact, there were damn few people in law enforcement anywhere who believed that criminal profiling uh, which didn't even have that name at the time, uh, that, it, that it could be real. So what happened was the FBI established its training academy in Quantico, and they staffed it with accomplished veteran agents to teach various things to both veteran agents and new agents. Among them were um, a Pat Mullaney, and again, an accomplished agent, a former uh, monk, but he had left the monastery, gone into psychology, and then ended up at the FBI and was, was a very good psychologist. Another was a guy named Howard Keaton, who was uh, an accomplished uh, crime scene analyst. He, he could walk onto a crime scene and see things uh, that that lesser agents couldn't see. 
these two guys got together in 1972 and started talking about this idea of whether uh, an agent, if he looked at a crime scene the right way, could he deduce something about the psychology or the behavior of the bad guy? And they believed he could. But as you pointed out, um, Hoover didn't believe in that. And, and he poo-pooed it and they just went about their business teaching a course in psychology and separately teaching a course in crime scene analysis. But then Hoover dies in 72 and a little more progressive leadership comes in into the fbi in the form of charles kelly and um or i'm uh, i i think that he didn't believe in it um much either just just maybe a little bit more than hoover so he gave teton and mulaney a little bit longer leash to explore the theory and they did, and they came up with a workshop that they could teach to agents, um, a, just exploring the idea. They didn't build any profiles. They just talked about the idea uh, and answered questions. Uh, but that's as far as it got. That was as long as a leash as they could get, uh, was just talking about it and exploring it. But again, even then, there was a lot of pushback, both among agents, but from local law enforcement. Uh, I, I, I think it's safe to say that, that there were fewer than 50 people in the United States who probably believed in the idea of what Teton Mullaney would later call criminal profiling. Most of law enforcement was against it. And to be honest, even today, there's a sizable uh, number of, of, uh, of law enforcement agents and officers who, who aren't true believers. Okay, so we go back to um, local law enforcement. Um, there was an elected sh sheriff who, I don't know how to put this nicely, was politically um, driven, I guess you'd say. And um, so he was not at all on board with this either, was he? No, I think he represented what, what we were just talking about. He didn't really believe in it either. But there was another thing. In that same park uh, five or six years earlier, there had been a, a Boy Scout camp out uh, and they had hundreds of Boy Scouts there for that weekend. And sometime overnight, one night, someone stole in and killed one of the Boy Scouts. Uh, the sheriff uh, never solved that case. Uh, they never really had any good um, suspects. They never brought any anybody to justice. Uh, and he paid a political price for that. Up to that, up to the point of Susie Yeager's disappearance, he'd he'd been under some criticism for having a good old boy sheriff's office out in southwestern Montana uh, that was more responsive to the political needs of the county than than the the crime issues that were going on. Uh, so when Susie Yeager goes missing. Uh, he, the sheriff, a guy named Andy Anderson, is um, highly sensitive to, to the possibility that he could have another boondoggle on his hands. So uh, he's happy that the FBI is getting involved. So can you take us through a little bit of a timeline of from the crime, how what were the tools or what were the, um, what they came up with that helped them to actually come up with this suspect and how long from the crime to arrest and that sort of thing? 
from that morning, uh, there was nothing. Uh, Pete Dunbar, the, the agent, the FBI agent, um, helped mobilize the biggest manhunt in Montana history to look for Susie, um, but they found nothing. After two weeks, that fizzled out. They still had nothing. They had no suspects, no evidence. Uh, and and the, the idea of opening it up to tips from the public was uh, difficult to say the least because they got hundreds of tips. A lot of them were just turning in a, a neighbor who, you know, they didn't like. Um, also, let's think about what was going on then. This is the historian. Uh, the, the, the historian's going to think, well, what is the context of the time? Well, Charles Manson's trial had ended just a year or so before. The, the Watergate was in uh, full bloom. Uh, the, 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 the war in Vietnam was still going and, and getting unpopular by the day. The counterculture movement was rising. Domestic terrorism in the form of the Weather Underground or the Black Panthers was rising. These poor people in Western Montana, mostly ranchers and farmers and shopkeepers, think the world is going to hell. And, and they're, they're wondering how long it could be till it's there on their doorstep. Uh, so there's there's a lot of fear at the time, uh, but there's not a lot of evidence. And frankly, months pass, and the FBI gets no more evidence. Uh, they get no more real suspects. They talk to seemingly everyone, but uh, if you were to ask someone who lived in Gallatin County at that time, they would have said it was hippies. You know, it was it, it, it was. It, it was outsiders. It was somebody from out there where where they're seeing the the Mansons and the uh, Juan Coronas, uh, Dean Coral, other serial killers whose names were in the news at that time. But at this point, this isn't necessarily a killing. This is a, a missing little girl. It's a kidnapping, and until. February of 1974, what, eight, nine months later, seven or eight months later, um, uh, it's, it's still just a kidnapping. In February, a teenage girl from a small town of Manhattan, Montana, a local waitress who's very popular in this dinky little town, uh, goes missing. And in, in the, the big search for her, they discover her car abandoned in a barn on an, uh, an old ranch where nobody lived anymore. Unfortunately, when they start to look a little closer, they start to find bits of bone scattered all over the area. And uh, without getting into the grisly details, ultimately they determine that this teenage girl, Sandra Smulligan, had been abducted, had been ultimately butchered, uh, cremated, and then pulverized, and then her remains scattered all over. Uh, the Smithsonian helped in that determination. But, they said, uh, there are remains of a little girl in here, too. These aren't only the remains of a teenage girl. There's a, there were remains of a little girl who answered uh, to Susie's description. At that point, uh, then it was presumed that they had a killing and a, a, a most ghastly kind of killing as well. Uh, but remember, no suspects, <laughs> no evidence no motives, no nothing. And Pete Dunbar, that FBI agent, is growing more and more frustrated by this. He doesn't believe in criminal profiling either, but when he's in Washington, Quantico, 
uh, attending some ordinary training that he was required to attend, he attends that workshop by Teton Mullaney. And while he doesn't buy into the idea entirely, he's got nothing else. So he follows them into their offices afterward and tells them his story. They decide, they invite him to send his, his work so far. And once they examine it, uh, they decide that this might be a case where they could try their idea. We, we might just put together a criminal profile and see if it works in, in real life, in real time. And so they did. And uh, it, it's a, a, a very interesting profile. It's all described in the book. There's about 20 elements to it. Some of it is uh, low-hanging fruit. Um, for example, they believed uh, this was a man, a uh, young man in, with military experience, partly because in both cases, a certain amount of stealth was required. A certain amount of strength was required. If you try to imagine carrying off a startled little girl in the dark, um, and they looked around, they believed he was local, and they looked around and said, "Well, then he must probably be white, since ninety-nine percent of this county is white." Uh, so there's some low-hanging fruit there. But uh, when they got deeper into it, I think they really touched on some interesting elements. And again, they're all described in the book. Uh, uh, and uh, so Dunbar, let's just say Dunbar takes it back to the investigation uh, where they still have no suspects. But they are narrowing it down a little bit. I'll leave it hanging there for oh, just yes. <laughs> <laughs> People are definitely going to want to read this. So um, did eventually, did Dunbar work alongside Teton and Mullaney? Did they all work together to eventually solve this, um, come up with their suspect who was eventually arrested and they worked together in in the technical sense. Teton and Mullaney never came to Montana. Mm -hmm. They never walked the grounds. They never met the people. Theirs was a more academic, intellectual exercise, which in this case um, might have been okay. I think I think it's not always that way. It's it helps to analyze the crime scene. In this case, they just didn't have it. And, and of course, it was only introduced to them seven or eight months after. So the, there really wasn't um, a crime scene anymore. Um, but yes, they worked together. It, it, it's worth noting that all along, Dunbar was not a believer. And when the profilers began to zero in on the, you know, four or five, then three or four, then one or two people, uh, Dunbar didn't, didn't think they were right. And there was a lot of friction between Dunbar and the profilers about whether they were right on this. And again, it goes back to his lack of confidence in the tool. But uh, again, he had nothing else, so he had to go with it. They finally uh, narrowed it down uh, closely enough to one guy. And, and uh, I don't want to, I don't know if we should spoil it. How Maybe people have already read the book. They narrowed it down to a local guy, a former Marine, um, uh, who had, uh, was working as a carpenter, uh, a handyman, doing a lot of things for a lot of people by himself. Uh, and they said, this is your guy. 
And this guy's name is David Meyerhofer. Um, he was a fairly bright guy. He was well-spoken. He was he self-employed. He was even helpful. He would show up at searches or show up at the cafe where deputies or agents were and talk to them. Um, he never had any run-ins with the law whatsoever. Uh, Dunbar had even dated David's mother when they were in high school. Uh, it was a small towns, right? But Dunbar didn't think this was the guy, yet the, the profilers insisted he was the guy. They started by saying, to give him a lie detector test. Dunbar says, we'll give him a lie detector test. The profilers believed in 1974 that, that a sociopath, psychopath could beat a lie detector test. Uh, Dunbar gave him the lie detector test and Meyerhofer passed with flying colors. Uh, there, was, there were a few other things happen. Again, we won't get into those details. They're in the book. Uh, and they gave him a second one. And he passed again with flying colors. More things happen. And this conflict between Dunbar and the profilers ramps up a little bit because Dunbar is absolutely convinced he's not the guy. He wasn't the guy before he passed two lie detector tests. They said, uh, he said, how about if we do a truth serum test? So they, everybody agreed to that, even though the profilers again said, the wiring in a psychopath is such that he can beat all of this. It won't show up the same way. Uh, and Meyerhofer beat the truth serum test too, with flying colors. In, no, in none of these three tests did he show any evidence of lying. I don't mean, he was mostly telling the truth. I mean, they saw no signal whatsoever that he was lying. So uh, they have to let him go. But because of the insistence of the profilers, they keep him on under surveillance and they watch him very closely. They even, they do it so openly uh, that at one point, David Meyerhofer walks up to the truck where one of the deputies is sitting and says, hey, I've got to run to Bozeman and I know you're going to follow me. So why don't we just save gas and I'll ride with you. <laughs> and uh, that's the way it was for a bit. Now I bet you're going to ask me about a phone call, right? I am going to ask you about a very pivotal phone call. There, there are several phone calls that happen here the, where the uh, Susie's abductor calls the family in Michigan. He's a sadist. He's, he's cruel. He's trying to drive a knife into the mother's heart and twist it. But the mother, a woman named Marietta Yeager, um, stands in there. She's not arguing with him. She's not yelling at him. She's not doing anything except showing a mother's concern for her daughter. And she, she keeps him talking and she, she talks to him in ways that a mother might talk to somebody like that. Uh, she keeps him on the line long enough that, that some tracing can go on, but it's ultimately not that useful. Um, but something else happens. He changes. And the profilers recognize that this mother, this powerful woman, a very, very strong woman, had an effect on him. And he changes. He changes from the sadistic, cruel uh, psychopath that he is. In in he at one point he's crying himself. There's a phone call that comes one night 
from the bad guy in this period when Meyerhofer is under surveillance. And um, oh, let me back up a little bit. The FBI, knowing that she has this effect on him, arranges a face-to-face -face meeting between Meyerhofer and Marietta Yeager. That happens, and uh, it, it, their confidence is going to shake him up enough that he's going to slip up. A few days later, a phone call comes in the middle of the night to her in Michigan, and it's the bad guy. And she refers to him all the, the time as David. And he denies that it's anybody named David. He doesn't know what she's talking about. But she does put him off balance. And during this phone call, he, he purports to put a little girl on who says, mommy, he's a nice man. He's treating me OK. There's no, the FBI couldn't come up with any evidence that it was Susie. It didn't sound like Susie. It might have even been a recording. But now the FBI and the local prosecutor says he might have another child. And if we truly believe it's David Meyerhofer, then we have to act now no matter what. And so they swoop in. They arrest David Meyerhofer in late September of 1974. And, and at the same time, they search his, um, his little renovated garage where he lives. And they find some uh, seriously incriminating evidence that uh, you, you almost could have gone right from the booking room to the gallows. It was so incriminating, so ghastly, that uh, he had no chance. He was, he was in deep doo-doo, to, to use a French term. Um, he has a lawyer. The lawyer is angry because the lawyer has believed in him too and tells him, David, you're going to be executed. We, we've barely been charged within the last two hours, but this is how bad this evidence is against you. It's, it's I'll try to be as kind as I can. It's, it's human parts, it's, it's flesh, it's, uh, it's, pieces of people that he has kept of Sandra Smolligan in this particular case. But his lawyer says, you're, you're as good as dead now. And he's, David proposes then, can we take the death penalty off the table if I confess to s some other murders? The prosecutor consults the mother, uh, the, the mothers of both Sandra Smolligan and Susie Yeager. And they agree that they will take, the prosecutor agrees to take the death penalty off the table if he confesses to two other murders that he is putting forward. It turns out that, remember that Boy Scout five years, six years before that had died in that same park, he'd killed him. And then there was another shooting of another 13 year old boy before that. So uh, he confessed to four murders, and uh, in return for there not being a death penalty uh, and just going to prison for the rest of his life. And that's not where the story ends, but uh, that's, that takes us through the investigation. Okay, so he's had this conversation the, with um, the lawyer and he's not probably going to do life. Um, he's being held in jail. Um, I believe it's Andy Anderson's jail. Andy Anderson is the sheriff, yes. Yeah, and so it takes a little bit of a turn there. Takes a big turn there. One of the 20 or so elements of the, the original criminal pro profile that Teton and Mulaney gave 
Dunbar and Anderson and the others was that when corner or when arrested, uh, the bad guy would try to kill himself. He would try to kill agents. He would try to kill law enforcement in general. He would be uh, a, a great danger. So you need to take uh, exceptional care in the arrest and you need to make sure he's not in any kind of a situation to commit suicide. Andy Anderson, um, who had to go out and hire a whole bunch of young deputies, uh, wasn't completely confident in the night deputy uh, at, at the Gallatin County Jail. Uh, so he didn't pass that along. He didn't want this deputy who he called a big mouth to, to tell people, you know, the way small towns do. Um, didn't want them, he didn't want this guy starting any rumors about these murders because up to this point, it's only known he's being charged with two. The, the world doesn't yet know that he's confessed to four. So Andy Anderson doesn't tell this night jailer the, the precautions, the typical precautions uh, to protect an inmate from committing suicide aren't taken. And uh, I guess you can deduce from that that David Meyerhofer committed suicide a few hours after his confession was delivered. And with him dies all the answers to all the questions we have now, 50 years later. Amazing. What a story. It's just um, just the idea of what happened, how it happened, you know, that somebody in the middle of the night can go into a tent and take a child. Nobody hears, nobody sees anything. And the end result is, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't have any words for that. So um, it, it's that kind of a story. And, yeah. and obviously, we're, we're going to talk about it here for an hour. But it's, there, there's a lot of detail. Um, if you don't like to read, uh, and you like to listen, I suggest picking up Patty Neiman's audio narration, because she did a remarkable job. Um, and you would think that a story with this kind of ghastly quality and whose cast of characters is largely men, Andy Anderson, Pete Dunbar, David Meyerhofer, all of them, that we would have gone with a male narrator. But when I heard Patty, I thought if we were going to lose a voice with a male narrator, it would be uh, Marietta Yeager, the mother, who I think is the hero of this story. Without her, the arrest of David Meyerhofer might never have happened. It might have taken much, much, much longer, uh, except for her involvement. So I wanted her voice to come forward. I wanted her to be right. And, and Patty captured that sensibility, that, that anguish, she captured the one voice that I didn't want to mess up and then caught all the rest of them too, just very capably. So I, I can't recommend uh, more highly uh, Patty Neiman's audio. That's one, so, um, so for those of you who are local, um, the old colony library network here in situ which is all of the um south shore and all the different libraries they do have um shadow man it's not here in situ but you can have it brought to situ along with three other books that ron has done with his latest book which is called death row um ron if you could just touch on your other books very quickly um just to let people know um I'm smiling because uh, Death Row isn't a true crime. Death Row is a mystery. It's a novel. I made it up. Um, so why take this drastic turn from New York Times bestselling true crime writer to be a mystery novelist? 
simple. It was COVID. Um, that kind of writing that I do, that narrative writing requires me to be there. I have to go out there and, and gather all this sensory detail so I can tell a story that feels that feels real to you as a reader. Uh, suddenly COVID, I can't, I can't get on an airplane. I can't check into a motel. I can't eat in a diner. I can't go into a, a courthouse, a library, but I sure can't talk face to face with the 150 to 200 people that I generally talk to for one of these books. So I'm dead in the water, except that I've spent 30 to 40 years as a journalist wading around in this, this grisly stuff. Um, and uh, I just locked myself in my office and decided to write a, uh, a mystery. And the mystery, Death Row, is about a group of old men in a small town in Colorado who gather together most days in a little diner and solve the problems of the world and compare who's got the best car battery and all those things that old men do in coffee clubs when they are sort of unwittingly dragged into a local murder investigation and they've become the forensic team. So that's what Death Row is. They call themselves Death Row. Death as in not hearing. <laughs> Well, Ron, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I'm sure many of our people on here who haven't read it, I'm sure you're going to go right out there and get it, or you are going to do the audio version with Patty, which for myself, that's the way that I go. Um, so is there anyone that has any questions? You can either raise your hand, put them in the chat. We'll take a few minutes and answer some of your questions. <clears throat> Oh, Any we, questions? We have no Lucille. dumb questions. We have Lucille who would like to answer a question. Lucille, if you are all right, me, so. Lucille, can you unmute? I'm trying. There oh, we go. Oh, now we hear you. Thank you. You know, it was fascinating. You are amazing. You're fascinating. Was, oh, you're too kind. Thank no, you. I mean, I mean that. Um, so you know, I like I I I'm, I like to read. I don't like the audio. I'd rather read and um. I read a lot of historical fiction. So let's talk about your latest. Is uh, is that, that's not true, is it? I mean, is it, what did you do with this? Oh, with Why Death it Row? Different? Yes. It's not historical fiction, it's set modern times. But okay. except that the, the, the characters are guys in their 70s or 80s and, and they get involved in an old cold case that goes back about 30 years. So and I wouldn't classify it as historical fiction in any way, uh, no. like Hampton Sides or some of these, but uh, I, it is the, the, the bad guy in in this story, the crime itself in this story are all drawn from real cases and uh, that I've covered or written about or people that I've actually talked to. Uh, I didn't mention it, but it's it's always fun and all a crowd pleaser that as a young journalist uh, back in the mid to late 80s, I interviewed Charles Manson. And really? so he, he really? pops up every, every so often, he pops up in my, uh, my memory bank. You really interviewed him? Well, let me put it this way. I say interview, but put that in quotes. Um, I was a young journalist and I, what I didn't know outweighed what I did know. I went in, I had one hour with Charles Manson. I asked one question and then Charles Manson did his little Charles Manson thing. Okay for about 59 minutes so <laughs> wasn't much of an interview oh my god oh you have me on the edge of my seat i want to go out and get those books all of them thank you well so shadow much. man is my latest and i think uh, you know every book you learn something and so in the in the sense that i'm learning with every single book 
then I I think Shadow Man is the the best. Yeah. But um, I I'm I'm attracted to stories that are more complex than you know a husband killed his wife or vice versa. I want something deeper and darker, uh, and where the characters are truly. Uh, somebody that we can identify with in the case of victims or or their families. Um, and so books like Alice and Gerald, a homicidal love story, has that. Um, it, the Darkest Night, which was my very first true crime, but is much more intimate because I'm involved in a sense. I, I wasn't, I didn't commit the crime. I wasn't at the crime, but these are these are two girls that live next door and who are in in every sense um, uh, sisters or cousins to me because we're together every day. We're in school. We're on the sand lot. Whatever we happen to do, so it's a much more intimate book uh, in that respect. Wow! Wow! Because sometimes. Um... I always like when I do read some kind of fiction, or historical fiction. I always want to know the author puts themselves. I mean, they they embellish certain things. Not everything is is a fact. Are you following me? Yes, yes. So and, and that that's I that can be explained. Please. I'm a journalist, and I want to use some of the tools from a novelist's toolbox. Okay. to tell a story, to make it um, feel like a novel. But I, I draw the line at making up anything, even a line of dialogue. Okay. Uh, I'm just not going to go there. But I am going to use things like foreshadowing. Uh -huh. I'm going to use things like character development, okay, uh, cliffhangers, things like that, that are naturally in the true story. I'm just going to recognize them and use them, oh. but I'm not going to make anything up. That said, I think there are a lot of people out there who don't have classical journalism training like I do, who, sure. th who think, oh yeah, you can make things up. Right. And I, I was recently asked to uh, do an endorsement of a book uh, like that, and I refused. Uh, once I started reading, I could see that there were certain things in the book that this writer could not have known and had to make up. So I just refused. You're wonderful. Very interesting. Thank you, Gene. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for having him. Oh, me. So, so, Ron, I do have a few questions. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking of them now. So um, Shadow Man took place so long ago in the 70s. Were there any of the people involved in this incident that you were able to actually talk to? Yes. Um, Susie Yeager's mother, chief among them, is still alive. Wow. Even today. Um, and um, we communicated here briefly last week. And I love her to death. She's a, a terrific person. And she's been through a lot. In her case, what's interesting is she became one of the nation's most um, moving opponents of the death penalty and travels around lecturing against uh, the death penalty and why she thinks uh, it's wrong. And um, I, because of my experience that I described, happen to believe in the death penalty when it's applied appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So we had some great conversations. Uh, Don Houghton, the deputy who showed up that morning at, the first, at first light after Susie Yeager's disappearance and who ultimately was the guy to slap the cuff, literally slap the cuff, cuffs on David Meyerhofer is still alive and we just recently talked. Wow. Uh, Howard Teton, one of the two pioneering profilers, was alive until uh, last, uh, in 20, late 2021. Um, but I did several interviews with him. Uh, and then a lot of 
uh, of the main players in that story, those are the three big ones who were still alive. Okay, we have a question from Anne. She says, are you writing, are your writings about the West? And um, oh. you mentioned collected or available. Oh, in the newspaper? No, there aren't. Uh, although some, some bits are at my website, ronfrancel.com under the news uh, folder, but no, I, I didn't, my, uh, uh, my reporting has, I, I didn't collect it. Now, Shadow Man is a story that I heard about while I was doing that, uh, but it, it, it obviously came much later that I was writing it. Uh, my newspaper stuff, I haven't, hasn't been collected in any way. Any other questions or comments, anybody? Okay, so Ron, this has been a fascinating evening and I'm so glad you've agreed to come here um, to Situate, mm -hmm. sort of. Situate. And, yes, Situate, there you go. And if you ever are coming up this way, we would love to have you in person. You know, at, I, uh, at, I would love to be there. I love your area. I was just out there a couple, uh, about a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. uh, touring around Boston and and then up to the New Hampshire and. Oh, we uh, would love just that. Beautiful. I love it. Yep. So, like I said, we'll keep in touch, and if you are ever in the area, please, we'd love to all meet you and have another sit down like this because it was an amazing evening. I would love to do that. And thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And please, if uh, if I am ever out there, please, please leave your door open. Well, oh, we, we all will, <laughs> certainly. Thank and thank you again. And tell us quickly where we can get your books. Yeah. yeah. Anywhere you buy books, they're they're available everywhere at Amazon, your local bookstore. I'm a big believer in libraries and independent small town bookstores. So if you can use them, please do. But anywhere you buy books, you can get it. Barnes and Noble, Amazon, you name it. Website again. Let's hear the website again. It's ronfrancel.com. Oh. Francel is F R A N S C E L L. Okay. Thank and you. And we we'll have this video ready probably tomorrow. I will send you a link to it, Ron, when um, Seth sends it to us. Seth, thank you very much for recording this presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this wonderful night. Ron, again, I can't thank you enough. And we will thank you. We'll see thank you, you all soon. Hey, and I, everybody, I'm on Facebook. I'm on all the social media. Friend me there or follow my web, my author site. Uh, and we'll, we'll stay in touch that way too. Yes, one of the interesting things, some of you, if you weren't here at the beginning, Ron actually has vineyards um, at his home in New Mexico. We had a nice discussion about making wine. I have a few grape vines in my yard. I do jelly, he does wine. Wonderful. So. Um, Follow them on Facebook. We're friends. We're Facebook friends as well. Um, he puts up some interesting posts, some interesting comments, and um, it's fun. He's a great guy. And thanks, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Good night everyone. everyone.